Let's talk about the public finance market, getting stuff done, getting deals done. And for that, we're joined by Gary Hall. He's president and head of public finance at Siebert, William Shank & Company, which is an investment bank. Um, and he is based in San Francisco, but he just got off the red eye, so he's here in, uh, in New York. We appreciate that. Gary, talk to us about the state of the municipal bond underwriting market. How has this year been in terms of issuance versus maybe a typical year? Yeah, well, you know, higher year interest rates have actually caused a decline uh, in our market volume. Um, obviously, if you have low interest rates, there, there's a large amount of refinancings done, right? And so that volume has sort of gone away. Um, in addition, we're still waiting for the largesse of the, I, the in, uh, Infrastructure uh, uh, Inf Investment Act to see benefits in our market, where we will start to see state and local governments sort of produce their share and their match through uh, bond issuance. We're still in the embryonic stages of the allocation of that legislation. So to date, uh, we still have sort of a depressed volume. So can you talk us through a little bit about what your expectations are for January? Is there still going to be a little bit of a depression overhanging the issuance market, or do you th feel like there could be some improvement? You know, I, I would tell you um, I'm pretty bullish on the direction that we're going um, for two reasons. Number one, you still see a lot of public support for infrastructure improvements. I'll give you an example. In Texas, which is viewed as a more conservative state, they just authorized $20 billion of issuance for K-12 in a state like Texas, right? And so that support tells me that we're going to have a lot more investment in the area. The other thing, as I mentioned before, we still have this pent-up demand for infrastructure needed in the country. And irrespective to where rates are or the cost of construction, folks are going to have to make these improvements. So I guess one of our guests today was saying the municipalities, they still have a lot of money sloshing around from all the stimulus from the pandemic. Is that how do you see that playing out in terms of their needs for capital well, um, going forward? Yeah, I think that's true, but a lot of that money is not specified for capital needs, right? Okay. Um, and the other thing that people don't realize, just like we're all getting readjusted post-pandemic and being back in the office and getting fully up to speed, our governments are doing this as well. And, and so just drinking water through a fire hose through all the different things that they're trying to manage, uh, doing infrastructure and uh, making infrastructure investments, it's important, uh, but it's something that they're getting around to to address the other issues that are affecting that local citizenry. You know, you were talking about the allocations from the um, inflation fund, the Inflation Act, and I wondered if you could talk about the longevity of federal support for investment. We've got a presidential election coming up next year. Well, uh, two things. One, um, I would say that, you know, a lot of the money that comes through this Infrastructure Act is actually flowing through, through the states, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of uh, control on the timing of these projects through the states. Uh, and that was purposely done in the legislation. The other thing that's really important is that we typically have federal money being dispersed based on some formula. Um, this requires a lot of completion of com uh, uh, applications for competitive grants which requires a lot of interagency, multi-governments coming together to show impact uh, for these improvements. That's a tough thing to do in a lot of the uh, localities around the country, especially given a lot of the political, political strife. And so that's one of the reasons that this has been slow off the start. That said, it's a presidential year, and folks want to see benefits of this legislation. So I'm, st I'm, I'm predicting that we'll start to see more projects actually being shovel ready. Once these projects are actually being implemented and we see the improvements, I think that's when we start to see more sustainable in, in investment in, in our infrastructure around the country. How does, a, how does a municipal investment banker go out and pitch? When I was in corporate finance, I had a list of clients and I'm just in their face all the time throwing ideas at them, throwing ideas. How do you guys do it? Is there, are there mandates that come down? How's that work? Oh, uh, that's a great question. And actually these market conditions have actually impacted that. When we're doing analysis for refundings, we can be at our desk. And as long as we know the debt portfolios of our clients, we can identify deals, right? But when you start to try to figure out the timing of new money projects, you have to be in front of clients. You have to be in city council meetings yep. and board meetings to know when those project timings. And so we're spending a lot of shoe leather getting in front of our clients to find those opportunities. And that's, that's a little tougher. The other thing is the regulatory environment, right? In the past, we could just provide ideas to our clients, and they had the own autonomy to choose what they want. Now, we're restrained on how we can pitch ideas. We've got to be sort of um, provide market information and not tailored solutions unless we have exceptions. So that's limited the lack of the actual engagement we can have with our clients.
Interesting. So where do you see the biggest opportunities, broadly speaking? Well, for us, uh, our firm, is we've been sort of counterintuitive. So we've made huge investments over the past, past year in three areas. We feel that higher ed is still going to be a burgeoning place as people come back to the classroom and infrastructure needs uh, are, are correlated with that. Uh, we're going to see major investments in that area. The K-12 through space, uh, we see it in Texas, we're going to see it in California. As we start to have population migration in different places, um, we're starting to see schools uh, making huge improvements in that area. And the other areas are those core infrastructure that we know we have to change, and that's transmission systems and water supply systems, both because they're aging and in need of repair and also to adapt to climate change. So do you, do you guys target states like the states that are are growing in population like a Florida or Texas and, and maybe not so much a Rust Belt state? Or how do you guys approach that? Well, uh, market conditions don't allow you to bore the ocean. Yep. <laughs> and yep. so, you, so you have to be somewhat targeted. Um, we've got 19 offices around the country. Okay. Uh, and, and having those spokes in those communities allows us to know where the deal flow will come. You've got, of your 19 offices, what provided the biggest surprise for you over the pandemic? I mean, you mentioned you had to expend a lot of shoe leather to get projects going, so I imagine that might have been quite tough, but where was the big win for you there? I would say Texas. I mean, yeah. you think of it being a conservative state, physically conservative, uh, and the fact they spent so much money on K-12 through um, capital improvements, that's been mind-boggling to us. Um, and so we're still working hard to capture that market share. It's tough. Uh, because it's so dispersed, and there are three, four different economies within Texas. But that said, uh, we, we're really bullish on the opportunities in Texas. How do you think, what's your outlook for 2024 in terms of that issuance number? I guess you said we were yeah. like 320 or so sure. this year, and you, the typical year is 400. Do you s think the market's going to be a little bit better? Our volume is comprised of two components. One, new money spent. Yep. New capital projects, right? And as, as, as uh, our issue, state and local issuers try to tap these federal dollars and need their local match, that's going to go up. Refundings is another component. And even though interest rates are, are, are high, we found this untapped market volume this year through the tender market um, uh, process. that so allows that? Li it literally, our issuers are allowed to ask investors to buy back bonds okay. so they can achieve savings, right? And it was something that was rarely used in the past. We've got over 50 billion, close to 60 billion of issuance of that this year. And I think that sort of muscle is sort of baked into our market now, and we'll see that going forward. Uh, real quick, where do you see demand for all these new issues coming from? Well, as we are now seeing a little bit more juice on the front end of the curve, true mom and pop retail is coming back into our market, which is very, very much welcome. We still have robust um, bond funds and other investment segments that are there. And as long as we have the tax system that we have in this country, people will be seeking relief. 30 seconds, Gary. Just tell us about your firm a little bit. I had not heard about it. Oh, so we are the largest minority-owned investment bank um, in the oh. country, um, a cornerstone in public finance, um, which we're going to be forever. Um, and along with the capital uh, capital markets and corporate as well as an asset management. Awesome. Gary Hall, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Gary Hall is the uh, president, and as soon as I can get this little screen off of my thing here, <laughs> uh, president and head of public finance uh, infrastructure for the firm Siebert Williams Shank and Company, uh, focusing on the municipal bond market.